There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, looks like we're gonna have a beautiful weekend to be out working in the garden. Welcome to the Growing Citrus in the Foothills workshop. And this is presented by the Master Gardeners of Placer County. My name is Becky Fritchie, and I'm gonna be your moderator today. As you saw in the opening slides, this workshop is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube site after it's been uploaded. The link to the video and accompanying resources can be accessed from our website, which is pcmg.ucanr.org. Now, if you have any questions during the presentation, please post them through the chat menu, and then we'll ask Sandy, who is our presenter, to address them at the end of the presentation. So Sandy, it's all yours, take it away. Thank you so much, Becky, and good morning, fellow gardeners. It is sunny and it's inviting outside. So thank you for spending part of your morning with the Master Gardeners of Placer County. My name is Sandy Fitzpatrick. I've been a Master Gardener since 2019, and I am very fond of the fruit that comes from the citrus trees. Before we talk specifically about citrus, this presentation will start with some slides describing the Master Gardener program. Master Gardeners are trained volunteers offering evidence-based information to home gardeners in order that they have success in their gardening. You can find us at, at many different places. Right now, we're using our hotline. We're using our uh, social media in order to talk about um, gardening facts and figures. And in normal times, you could find us at workshops, at fairs and festivals, maybe even the farmer's market, our garden fair and Mother's Day. But right now with COVID-19, we're not able to do in-person um, connection. So we're doing it this way, virtually. We miss you and hope to be back with you soon. Today's workshop is intended to provide an overview. And we're gonna take a look at some citrus facts and history, how you would select a tree and your site, planting strategies, irrigating, fertilizing, pest management, pruning, thinning, and protecting the tree. This workshop is intended to do that briefly and, and succinctly. But at the end of the presentation, and actually it's already up on the Master Gardener website that, that Becky gave you earlier, you can find the PowerPoint and you can find a resource list. And that risk resource list has links that connect you to more information about any of these topics. And this photo is some beautiful mini olas from one of our Master Gardener's homes, yum. Let's take a look about citrus. So citrus is in the genus of flowering trees and shrubs. It's in the rue family, Rutaceae. And there's the common and unusual citrus. The common things we all know and love, oranges, lemons, limes, um, mandarins, grapefruit. And then there's a couple of the unusual. And I've just highlighted three of my favorites. The one on the left is a picture of mandarin quats. They're from my sister-in-law's home, who's also a master gardener. In their center, that very unusual Buddha's hand. And on the right, a picture of my new intriguing favor, the Australian finger limes. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. Satsuma mandarins originated in Japan over 700 years ago. And the first evidence of citrus here in California was in the mission gardens in the late 18th century. By the 1880s, there were huge orange groves in Southern California in what we now call Los Angeles. But you'd be hard pressed to find a citrus grove in the city of Los Angeles right now. Today, our state is the leading supplier of fresh citrus, lemons and oranges, and of course, mandarins. Citrus is a big deal to the state of California. Commercially grown citrus yields a $7 billion economic value annually to the state. And we know in Placer County, there's also a great economic value from all the citrus trees that show up here. According to the California Pest and Disease Prevention Program, 50% of all California residences have a citrus tree. I have two of them. Now, if we were together, I'd get a show of hands to see how many you have in your yard. I have a neighbor down the street, I think she has five. And I wonder if anyone knows when mandarins first came to Placer County. Satsuma mandarins have been farmed in Placer County for over 125 years. 
It's our fertile soil and great growing conditions that make Mandarin so appropriate to, um, to grow and successfully um, have the fruit from it. Welsh settlers established Penryn in the 1880s and they planted fruit orchards as a way to make their livelihood. They had pears and plums and oranges and, and um, peaches and just a variety of orchards. As a result of their efforts by the mid 20th century, our county was known as the fruit basket of the nation. Unfortunately for those early settlers, a disease took out their pear trees. They had to be cut down and burned. So the risk of that disease infecting other trees would not occur. The farmers had to figure out what to do with the land that they had. They saw that their mandarin crops were successful and they turned to mandarins. They bought a sizing machine and they quickly started selling their produce to stores and local communities. Pretty soon they were shipped nationwide and some of the mandarins are even been shipped overseas during wars. Why would you grow citrus? Well, you all obviously are citrus fans because you're on this um, video today. This is a lovely picture of a pixie mandarin taken from a, a farm up in Newcastle. We like fresh and nutritious food. And if we grow our own citrus, that's what we're guaranteed to get. There are over a thousand varieties of citrus and its citrus relatives. And as Kevin Marini, who's the coordinator of the Master Gardener program here in Placer County likes to say, plant what you're gonna eat. And with a thousand varieties, there's sure to be one citrus or two that you're going to like. When you grow your own citrus or any food, any for that matter, you have a connection to it. You can share with your family how it grows and you have the pride of watching your fruit go through the season and yield you this great um, robust um, harvest at the end of the season. Citrus trees are evergreen. So some people like them for their landscape element in their yard. And in South Sacramento, you can find fruit trees that are four or five times taller than me that the residents have used for sun protection. And you know what? Citrus just tastes good. As I like to say, nothing says winter like the smell and the taste of fresh citrus. Let's start with how you're going to select a tree and what tree you should select. Well, the first thing to know is that your citrus trees are long lived. They could go 50 plus years. And that means the tree that you buy is an investment. So you want to make the right decision, plan it correctly, and take care of it so you reap the benefit from your investment. If there's one slide in the slide deck that I would like you to take away and remember, it's this part in red in the center of this slide. It is so important that you buy certified citrus, that you buy it from a reputable nursery. And that way you're guaranteed that you're gonna get a tree that is certified disease free and it's true to type. Nothing would be more sad if you planted an orange tree and you ended up with limes. Well, maybe if you like limes, it'd be okay, but you didn't get what you wanted, I guess was my point. Do not buy your citrus trees from other states, other counties, and definitely not from other countries. The quarantine laws protect the health of California citrus. And for us, they protect the health a Placer County citrus. Now I'm not gonna tell you which tree to buy, but I will tell you that mandarins are the most popular citrus here in the Sierra Nevada foothills. And that's because our soil and our climate, our warm days and cool nights are conducive to successful growing. When you think about buying a tree, you also need to think about the rootstock. So when you look at a citrus tree or, or most trees, you'll see a crook in the trunk. And that crook is called the graft union. Citrus trees have two parts, a scion and a rootstock, and they join together at the graft union. The scion is above, it's the top portion, and it determines the fruiting variety of the tree that you're about to purchase. And the rootstock influences the tree's vigor, its size, and its resistance to disease and pests. You want to identify and purchase a trifoliate rootstock. They're used for cold tolerance, to ensure fruit quality, to ensure disease resistance, and they're semi-dwarfing. Within that, there are two specific rootstocks that are adapted and perfect for our foothills. And that is the Rich 16.6 and the Rubido. If you're unsure, if this sounds complicated, because you're buying your citrus from a reputable nursery, you can ask the question of them 
about the rootstock. If you're thinking you might containerize your citrus, then the rootstock you're looking for is called Flying Dragon. I just love that name. It has nothing to do with the workshop, but I just think that's a great name for a rootstock. So if you select the appropriate rootstock for your environment, your soil conditions, and your resistance to the disease qualities, you will have successful, successful um, outcome from your citrus tree. So this is a picture of a graft union if you were in doubt, the scion above the rootstock below. I did take this at a nursery, so it's a containerized plant and a young plant. Um, this is actually a dwarf orange, and you can see the graft union very clear in this picture. And I didn't realize till I got home that there was a more mature tree behind it with its graft union evident as well. One of our master gardeners used to work at a reputable nursery. And she said the question that she got most often from people who had citrus was, what is that vigorous spiny growth that has no fruit that's coming up through the center of my tree or from a branch? Well, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But if you see growth that appears below this graft union, it should be removed immediately. And um, that's the picture of that. And um, you'll notice that what that does, since it has no fruit and it's vigorous growing, it takes the energy and nutrients away from the plant itself. So we know about our tree, and now we're going to think about where we would plant it in our yard. As master gardeners like to say, it's about the right plant in the right place. Citrus are sun lovers. They like eight hours, and they need that for flowering and fruit production. Your tree should be placed in a south or southwest facing section of your yard or your property and near a water source. You also want to protect from strong winds. If you're having a wind tunnel, say, running through your property, that's not where you want to put your citrus tree. Those strong winds we had just about last month, I guess, right, or earlier this month that took down some fences and did other damage. Well, about a week and a half after that, I looked at my citrus tree and thought, what happened here? And after researching our integrated pest management site, I realized that that strong wind had damaged some of my leaves. And what I meant by that was they turned brown, they twisted, but they remained on the branch. They're, they're going to go away soon, but they remained on the branch. So that was an extreme windstorm, but you do want to think about planting your tree so it's somewhat protected from strong winds. If you live in a marginal zone, you should consider container planting so that you can move your tree to a south facing wall or indoors when the weather gets cold. And really the upper limit for successful citrus growing is 1200 to 1500 feet. And that range of 12 to 15 has to do if you have a microclimate on your property that will support um, the health of the tree. So you have your tree, you know where you're gonna plant it, and now we're gonna talk about how to plant the, the citrus tree. You want to begin by digging the hole as deep as your root ball is high and twice as wide. You want to plant in the springtime, and guess what? March or April are the ideal months to plant your citrus tree. Citrus trees are shallow rooted. The feeder roots are in the top two feet. So as you plant, think about making sure that those roots have a chance to extend out. Most of the citrus that you find now for sale in your reputable nursery is in a container. You seldom find bare root trees here, um, to, again, to protect disease. If it's been in the container too long, the roots could be bound or they could be kinked. And what you'll want to do is not plan it that way, is start to tease out or gently pull out um, those leaves, unwind them. And as you've done that, you'll put a small mound in the bottom of your hole. The roots are now unwound. You spread it over the mound with the tips going down. The graft union should be above the ground and you want to backfill with your natural soil, no need to add amendments and tamp it down. Planting is so important overall to the health of the tree that we have a second slide here to share some important information about planting. So you've tapped it down from the last slide and now you'll top dress with a few inches of compost and cover with a coarse mulch, say, say a bark. Remember to leave two to three inches of bare soil next to the trunk 
so there's no chance for disease impacting the trunk and getting onto the tree. Water well after planting. If you have a new planted tree right now, you want to monitor it closely. And when the soil feels dry in the top six to eight inches, you'll want to make sure that you water it. You can do that with a soil probe or with your finger just to test it. In the first year, you'd like to give your tree frequent watering so that the soil stays moist but not wet. Citrus trees do not like, as we like to say in Master Gardener language, they don't like wet roots. And so you don't want to saturate the soil and leave the tree in wet roots. You want to whitewash your trunk. Do that with a 50-50% mix of interior white latex paint or, and water, so 50-50 mix. And if we were together, I would say, who knows why we do that? And somebody would raise their hand and say, we do that to prevent sunburn. In elevations of 1,200 to 1,500 feet, you will need to protect from cold. And I just want to remind you about that responsibility and obligation you have to the tree if you're going to try citrus in those higher elevations. The other thing, last thing about planting a citrus tree, I guess, is to avoid planting it in the lawn. And why do you think that is? Yeah, you probably heard me say it before. Lawns need more water, citrus doesn't need that much, and it will be unhappy. That leads us straight into a discussion of irrigation. So the correct watering of your citrus tree leads to the development of quality fruit and helps the tree build its natural resistance to fungal disease. The frequency of water is determined by your soil type and your weather conditions. We want to be mindful of summer stress. And that means we have hot, dry summers here. And so you'll want to maintain adequate water consistently to the tree so that it's better to withstand that temperature, that high temperature, and the water will, will the adequate water will hold the soil in its temperate um, condition. When high temperatures are predicted for several days, and you all know our summers here and know that we will get temperatures over 100 degrees for several days in a row in late summer, you'll want to irrigate in advance of the heat. So pay attention to the weather forecast, know when those hot days are coming, and give your trees some extra water in advance of the heat. And just one more slide about irrigation. Initially, you want to have your water source fairly close to the root ball, and that's usually with the drip. And you'll want to begin to move it further out as the tree becomes established. As you see in this photo, you'll see those feeder roots right across the top, on the top part of the soil, as we mentioned. And you'll see that the canopy has moved out. And in this photo, the drip line has gone out to be equal to the canopy of the tree. What happens if you give your tree too much or too little water? Well, if you underwater the tree, you tend to have small fruit, stressed tree, and sunburn tendencies on the fruit as well. If you overwater, we've talked about this already. This is the last time. If you overwater, you predispose the tree to root and crown rot. So a few words about fertilizing your citrus tree, both the new and, and more established trees. Typically, most nutrients are available in local soil. We're so fortunate about that, with one exception, and the exception is in nitrogen. If you're unclear or in doubt about the soil you have in your property, or say you're just moving in, as one of our master gardeners is doing to a new property, you could request a soil analysis. And on the resource list, that's now available on our website, you will find a link for home gardeners to request, how to request and obtain a soil analysis. So there's not much nitrogen in our local soil. So mature citrus, and now we've switched from planting to mature. Mature citrus will require nitrogen three times a year. Prior to bloom, now my tree in Roseville, West Roseville is already putting out those blooms, so I wouldn't do it now. Second application is May to June, and no later than August for your third application, as that might affect the fruit quality. We're, we're getting past this now, but when I first started doing this presentation, one of the master gardeners said, my, my citrus tree is turning yellow. What happened to it? We call that winter yellowing, and it's tied back to nitrogen. 
So a good application of your nitrogen following the directions on the fertilizer um, package um, early prior to bloom will help counter yellow, wet, yellow um, wintering of your leaves and um, actually of the leaves. The other thing to keep in mind here is that you may have enough nitrogen in your soil, but it's so cold from the temperature dropping that the tree is not able to access it. If your favorite citrus is a dwarf or it's in a container, use less fertilizer than you would for a tree planted in the out soil. A word about fertilizing. I learned this the hard way. Maybe some of you have too. More is not better. Over fertilization could cause excessive new growth. It makes the tree susceptible to disorders such as bacterial blast. And in worst case, as mine, it wasn't a citrus, it was a rose. Too much fertilizer added to a dry stress plant could damage or even kill the plant. The last word about fertilizer smarts, read and follow the directions explicitly for the amount, the frequency, and the precautions. Does my citrus tree need pruning? And when should I do it? Well, citrus trees are evergreen, but they do require occasional pruning. Pruning helps keep the tree small or short so that you can facilitate harvest and you can avoid ladders. That's, that's a good thing to avoid in the garden. Pruning allows sunlight in and it helps the fruit develop its flavors and sugars that we know to be true to citrus. If the tree develops a dense canopy because it's not been pruned, then the sunlight is blocked, air circulation is blocked and increases the risk of disease including this little soft body scale munching away on that citrus branch. A little bit more about pruning. The ideal time to prune is just prior to bloom. So if you already see bloom, you should wait. If you don't, you could, or just after the fruit sets. So when you see the little baby citrus on your tree and you know that they've set, that's an okay time to do some pruning minor. Minor pruning can be done at any time and avoid late season so you don't get a, a rush of growth right before the frost. Probably one of the most important things about pruning is to remove crossing branches. So really take a look at the tree, look inside, and if you see branches crisscrossing like this, or well, that was a T, didn't quite look up, that was a T. Or in our case, we happened to look at our citrus tree this year and saw one branch that was heading out to the right all of a sudden took a U-turn and was coming back all the way through the center of the tree. That was a crossing branch that had to go. You'll want to prune suckers, water sprouts, and dead wood anytime that you see it. And the water sprout is what I was describing earlier about the graft union. Water sprouts are vigorous growing, fast growing um, branches that appear to um, come from usually the rootstock or can come from another branch. You'll recognize them by the long thorns they have and the fact that they have no fruit on them. Remove the water sprout. It's just taking nutrients from the tree and preventing your, um, your other citrus from producing appropriately. You don't really need to prune young trees. And if you have the frost damage that came last year or earlier this year in winter, you can prune that in the spring. That's a healthy looking citrus tree in that picture. We're going to talk a second about skirt pruning. The branches that hang to the ground on a tree are what we would call a skirt. Branches that hang to the ground can cause problems for you. It can impede your weeding, how you fertilize, and your compost application. And it also allows ants or other soil-borne pathogens that can cause plant disease to very easily hop on the branches if they're that close to the ground. In winter, when your tree is laden with fruit and the branches are heavy, they have a tendency then to also droop and get closer to the ground. So the advice we recommend from Master Gardeners is to skirt your tree one to two feet above the ground level. Do you have to thin a citrus tree? Not necessarily. Citrus trees naturally adjust the amount of fruit that it can carry. So an early fruit drop is normal, 
This is a picture of my early fruit drop from last year. You can see the little tiny, um, this is actually under a man, uh, Satsuma mandarin, and you can see them on the ground. Now, intellectually, I know why the tree drops those. I understand the natural thinning that it does, but it does make me a little sad to see baby, baby citrus, or baby fruit lying there on the ground. So early fruit drop is normal, so sad. <laughs> If you see the excessive drop of older fruit, then you may want to investigate as that could be caused by several things. Lack of water or fertilizer, heavy pruning, sudden temperature change, or even an insect infestation. No conversation about citrus in our county or even in our state would be complete without a discussion about the Asian citrus psyllid or ACP. The ACP is a tiny aphid-sized insect that's a winged invasive species. This photo is great because it shows you the adult and it also shows you the, the, the um, nymph here underneath the shoot. The next photo will see how big it really is. The ACP was first detected in 1998 in Florida and in California a decade later, your citrus producing fruits. The psyllid, the psyllid was um, a terrible blow to the Florida citrus industry, one they're still recovering from. This is the actual size of an ACP, so you can see they are indeed tiny, but they are destructive. This, this little um, psyllid was found in Placer County in 2016 and again in 2017. By January of 2018, the county issued a quarantine for bulk citrus and nursery stock. That reiterates the point above by certified um, citrus from a reputable nursery. That little insect can damage trees by feeding, but its major threat is that it carries Han Lung Bing, a disease that's deadly to citrus trees. Han Lung Bing is also known as citrus greening and this photo helps us take a look at what the leaf um, symptoms would look like. There's no known cure to citrus greening and it'll kill a tree in five years. If detected earlier, you'll be asked to remove the tree. It affects all commonly grown citrus varieties, so there's not, not much citrus that can escape it. The leaf symptoms are pretty well displayed in this photo. There's non-symmetrical leaf yellowing and some splotchy yellow spots. The fruit symptoms are uneven ripening and a bitter taste. The only way to protect the trees and to prevent the spread of Han Lung Bing is to control the psyllid population and destroying any infected trees. So we would recommend to home gardeners that you inspect your trees monthly, particularly during the growing season one of our master gardeners does pay close attention to her tree. She noticed something suspicious. She did what she should. She reported that leaves to the California Department of Food and Agriculture to their pest hotline. They came out and tagged the tree. They took somewhere between 40 and 50 leaves from that tree and surrounding citrus that she had, ran their test on it, and good news for her and for our county, it was not ACP. This is a picture of something that just showed up on my tree two days ago. So the Placer County Department of Agriculture has an ongoing insect trapping program. And this is a picture of the insect trap. They trap for ACP during the growing season for citrus, which is now, this, um, this was the representative from the Department of Agriculture had placed this trap in my, um, this is in the mandarin tree. And um, the traps will stay for eight weeks. This was after day one and a half, and you can already see that there are some little insects trapped. And what they're looking for, obviously, is ACP to make sure it doesn't extend into Placer County and destroy our industry of citrus and our home garden, too, as well. Perhaps there's some hope for ACP and citrus greening. Finger limes, remember that little picture from the early slide? Australian finger limes have natural immunity. They seem to be a type of citrus that's immune to getting Han Lang Bing. 
Researchers have identified the gene that causes that immunity. They, researchers out of UC Riverside, I should say. They identified that gene. They created an antibiotic that in a controlled environment appears to kill the disease. Now it's still a long ways away from having a cure, but it does look like there's some serious effort in that direction. So Australian finger limes are small elongated fruit. You can see in the photo in the top, they come in multiple colors and they come in multiple colors on the same tree. They're kind of leathery on the outside, smooth leathery, little, little, um, little indentations on them. In the picture on the bottom, you can see why they're known as the caviar of fruit. And if you have a chance to taste a finger lime and bite into that little fruit, those little um, vesicles that you see there, it will burst in your mouth with a sweet, tart taste. Some people love this taste. Some high-end restaurants use it with their seafood and sometimes in alcoholic beverages. Um, some people think the taste is too tart. I, I find it refreshing and such a surprise to, to bite down on that pot. Australian finger limes are grown in Placer County and you can find them at a master at a farmer's market usually in the fall. Pest management and citrus trees. Foothill citrus are less prone to insect and disease pests than other places. Aren't we fortunate we have the great climate, the great soil, and trees that seem to be less prone. We, we have it made here for growing citrus. If you want to learn more about California-specific pest information for citrus, the Integrated Pest Management, IPM link, is included in that resource document at the end of this program. And I would suggest that you take a look at that link for any disease that you have. I mean, it's great for Beyond Citrus, but today we're talking about citrus. It was this link that I went to that I was trying to figure out what happened to my citrus tree. And after I went through disease and pests, I then went to environment. And that's when I realized it was that windstorm that had damaged the leaves on my citrus tree. Please do not use pest information from other states. California has restrictions on the use of many pesticides. Other states may not have those restrictions and the information you receive, say if you Googled it or looked online, may not be relevant or appropriate to California law. Want to do a commercial here for the Master Gardeners of Placer County's hotline. For specific questions, you can call um, as those questions arise and the number is 530-889-7388. So while this is a presentation on citrus, our Master Gardeners are trained researchers and they will be happy to look up any specific question you have on any um, information that occurs in your garden, pest management or otherwise. Healthy trees that have good soil drainage typically require no pest management. We are so fortunate. The last topic of today's presentation is what happens when the temperature gets low? How do we protect our trees and how do we protect the fruit? So what happens when the freezing temperatures arise is it damages the plants of the, the plants by causing ice crystals. It forms in their cell, the vegetation withers, and it turns dark. And this is a great picture of frost damage on a citrus tree. How can you prevent that? Well, you'll want to irrigate well prior to the freeze as the wet soil maintains temperature. And yes, that is exactly what I said we should do when temperatures get high. So when temperatures get very hot or temperatures are about to freeze, irrigate well before that wet soil maintains the temperature and you help to protect your tree. If your tree is young, say three years or younger, you wanna cover it with burlap or row cover. Be sure that you, the cover does not touch the foliage of the tree and that you remove it in the morning for air circulation. And some folks will use incandescent lights on young trees to help protect them. That's how to protect the, the tree. How do we protect the fruit? The effect is the same in the fruit. Ice crystals form in the fruit. They cause the juice vesicles to rupture and the fruit will dry out. Your fruit is edible after a freeze, but it becomes susceptible to decay, decay and will quickly become unusable. How can you prevent that, that frost damage or freeze damage to your fruit? Well, when you think about a citrus tree, the leaves and the fruit are the most sensitive part of the tree compared to the hardwood or the branches. Trees with fruit are less tolerant to the freeze. 
So if you pick your fruit before a freeze, you save the fruit and you have a good chance of saving um, the tree as well. This is a picture of the resource link that you can find on the website. That is pcmg.ucanr.org. Go to this particular workshop and this resource list is already there right, um, right after it. This picture shows success. Isn't that beautiful? This is my friend Jan with her bumper crump of Awari Satsuma mandarins. I can't think of a better picture to show success in growing citrus. So today we try to offer to you the tips for successfully growing citrus here in Placer County. Buy your trees from local nurseries only to ensure that they are certified and disease resistant. Select a sunny location of eight hours, plant well and mulch. Provide adequate irrigation throughout the growing season. Ramp it up when hot temperatures are, are planned. Apply nitrogen application three times a year to encourage growth. Occasional pruning may be necessary. Look out for those water sprouts. Recognize the signs of ACP and monitor your citrus monthly, particularly now during the growing season. Know that there are pest management resources available to you and the Master Gardener of Placer County hotline is always there for you. And set some techniques on frost protection. This particular orange to the right is from my neighbor's tree. It's a blood orange and you can tell by the bright color of the flesh. So all that's left for you is to let the tree provide you with the best fruit for picking and eating, for fresh squeezed orange juice for breakfast, for making marmalades, jellies, and lemon bread for dessert. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday morning. I'm happy to answer any questions, or if I can't, there's other great master gardeners on this call who can help as well. That's it for now. Becky, you have a question for me? I have no questions, which that was uh, a great workshop, Sandy. And you know, I grew up in Orange County and nothing was better than the smell of the orange blossoms just wafting all over the county. Oh wait, we do have a question. It says, do you have to pick all the fruit before the next bloom? That's a really good question. Mine doesn't last that long. Um, I do not know the answer to that, but I can direct you to our Master Gardener hotline, 530-889-7388 and they can provide that. But there are other master gardeners on the call. If any of you have the answer to that, would you like to chime in and unmute yourself? I don't see any answers. Um, we have another question from Jane asking if you can purchase the fruit trees from Costco. The recommendation from the Master Gardener program is that you buy from a reputable nursery. So you can ask the questions about the rootstock as you can find that answer, then that would be a place that you could, you could buy from. But we recommend, um, Master Gardeners are not allowed to recommend a specific commercial provider. So my advice to you is buy from a reputable nursery. Thank you, Jane. I know you were on early. Appreciate your interest in the topic. Okay, we've got a bunch of questions that just came in. Um, when picking fruit, if a part of the branch comes off at the fruit, is there a problem with the health of the tree? No, there's not. I, I think I probably tugged a little too hard sometimes myself. Thank you for your question. Okay, next question. Can you talk about the pros and cons about growing citrus from seed from store-bought citrus? So is this a question about propagation and trying to grow? Um, I, think, I think this might be the question. If you save a seed from your citrus tree, can you try to grow it from seed? I, I'm guessing that's the question. Becky, do you think that was the question? I, I, I'm guessing that, yes, correct, yes. I, I guess when I think about um, some of the thoughts about propagation, and again, I'm gonna refer this caller to the hotline as well, um, the, the tree that you purchased was a very specific rootstock and a very specific scion on top. It provided to you a very specific tree. And sometimes the seed 
because of connecting those that those two pieces together may have something else in it. For example, the mineola is a combination of two different fruits together. So I am not 100% sure. I guess the answer is depends, but you may be at risk from your seed of not being able to get a plant that's true to the mother plant that you had. Again, my friend, please be sure you call our hotline 530-889-7388. And I'm going to give them a heads up that there's going to be some citrus questions coming in on Monday. Thank you. <clears throat> and the last question is, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the first half. Did you cover or have resources and tips for pruning? I, I yes, did. Have, did. Go ahead, Becky. I, I just, um, it'll, you'll find the presentation uh -huh. with those with those tips because Sandy did cover it and it'll be once we're, we're done recording and we've uploaded it to our website, it'll be on PC dot, I mean, MGP, I can't even talk today, uh -huh. PCMG dot UCANR dot org. Right. And, and the slide deck, the slide deck. this on the slide. Yeah. Oh, um, oh, another question, Sandy, real quick, would be our last question. Can you recommend a nitrogen source? Again, I would say go to your reputable nursery um, and investigate the products there that, that you could find um, in order to get the appropriate balance for your soil conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Sandy, for everything. That's the end of the questions for today. And I would like to thank Sandy Fitzpatrick. That was a wonderful presentation. And I want to remind everybody that you can find the link to the handouts and this recorded workshop. Um, give us some time to, to download or upload it. And it'll be under pcmg.ucanr.org under virtual gardening workshops. And if you look under upcoming events, you'll see links and information to our, our virtual future virtual workshops. On uh, April 10th, we have gardening in a climate change. And if you have gardening questions in the meantime or related to anything else, you can click on our, the link on Ask a Master Gardener on our website. Thank you everybody for attending and we'll see you April 10th. Bye-bye.